Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Lahari from Penang International Dental College and the lecture for today is radiographic interpretation and radiographic features of diseases manifesting in the jaws part 3. As with the previous two lectures, the um, learning outcomes would be uh, nearly the same, but we would be looking at the radiographic features of TMJ, salivary gland disorders, uh, anomalies of the paranasal sinuses and other craniofacial anomalies in detail. This particular lecture will involve TMJ disorders, salivary gland disorders, paranasal sinus anomalies, traumatic conditions and soft tissue calcifications. So let's start with TMJ disorders imaging. So this is just to summarize the anatomy of the temporomandibular joint. Um, it's important to remember that the joint comprises of the head of the condyle and then part of the articular surface and the eminence and then there is an inter interarticular disc which is a fibrocartilaginous structure. So do, for performing diagnostic imaging of the TMJ, uh, it may be necessary to supplement it with clinical examination. It's important to understand that specifically for TMJ disorders, thorough clinical examination and arriving a diagnosis is utmost importance uh, before diagnosing uh, or diagnostic procedures are advised. So the application of diagnostic imaging in TMJ disorders would be primarily to look at osseous abnormalities, infections in cases of history of trauma, significant dysfunction or alteration of range of motion or significant changes in occlusion. Again, it's important to remember that minor TMJ um, dysfunctions or um, alterations in range of motions do not really warrant diagnostic imaging. And both joints must be imaged for comparison. For osteous structures of TMJ, the imaging mortality that is preferred would be either panoramic imaging or more detailed uh, and higher uh, resolution images like CBCT or multi-detector CT images. Uh, whereas for soft tissue of the joints, it is best imaged with MRI, um, especially in conditions like disc displacement with TMJ, uh, pain or and dysfunction, and to supplement osseous imaging in cases of neoplasm or infection. <clears throat> the conventional radiographs like the transcranial, transorbital, and transpharyngeal views, like the ones I've shown here, have are obsolete now. And the panoramic view is primarily used to get a broad overview of anatomical structures of the TMJ. It is primarily, uh, a panoramic view can help to rule out gross disease like asymmetries, extensive erosion, neoplasm, fracture, or large osteophytes. Minor details are um, <clears throat> difficult to delineate on panoramic view and it may be less reliable uh, to solely base your diagnosis on a panoramic view especially for the TMJ because it has thicker image layers and an oblique distorted view of the TMJ. This is an extension of the panoramic view uh, also with the same equipment which is called as a TMJ open and closed view which gives you an idea of the location of the TM joint when the jaw is open as well as when the jaw is closed. The CT scan of a TMJ again is uh, reserved for serious diseases like neoplasia of the TM joint and uh, can give a very good view of the osseous uh, component of the TMJ. CBCT scan also of the TM joint would be reserved for uh, uh, osseous component viewing of the TMJ where a disease process is suspected and uh, um, a clearer view of the joint is um, required. On the other hand, the MRI of the TMJ is specifically reserved to view the disc. Uh, this is a comparison of a normal disc on the MRI and a displaced disc. You can see the soft tissue component which is displaced anterior to the condyle, um, the bony condyle here. And this is the MRI view of a TM joint. Arthroscopy of the TMJ, which is a procedure where injection of uh, 
or, or uh, you know injection of dye is done and uh, or you can view with an endoscopic view of the TMJ this is less uh, opted these days um, and it is um, again a very painful procedure and a very skill uh, requiring or technique sensitive procedure arthrography is when dye is injected into the TM joint um, radio opaque dye is injected it's contrast media to evaluate the joint space again like I told you it is of less significance these days and is more replaced by the MRI and CT images moving on to the salivary gland disorder imaging um, imaging of the salivary glands is primarily done to diagnose and plan uh, management as well as follow-up of patients um, having salivary gland disorders. There are various imaging techniques that have been adopted to visualize the salivary glands and we will go through each one of these in detail. Let's talk about plain images first. These plain images, I mean um, plain radiographs. Um, generally, uh, you use intraoral occlusal views to view of when you are suspecting siloliths in the submandibular duct or panoramic view when you're expecting uh, siloliths in the parotid and submandibular gland. So mind you, there is a difference in what is written over here. Um, what you're seeing on this image is a cropped panoramic view, is a staphnase bone cavity. The reason I've mentioned this here is it's not a true cyst. It's a corticated defect in the posterior mandible below the inferior dental canal. And it uh, may contain part of the submandibular gland. A silolith is a common um, occurrence in the submandibular salivary duct. Uh, we are aware of the reasons why the Wharton's duct is a more common location is because of its tortuous course and uh, uh, location of the duct and also the components of the saliva that is secreted by the submandibular salivary gland itself. So, um, siloliths can vary in their radio opacification based on the calcification and the density. Uh, the x-ray that is shown here is a cross-sectional occlusal um, view of the mandible and you can see that there are few radio opacities in the salivary duct which is um, the proximal component of the duct very close to the orifice of the uh, duct. Ultrasonography, um, high resolution ultrasonography in specific is a very important method of imaging the salivary glands. Um, initial assessment of the parotid and submandibular salivary glands can be done with ultrasonography. Uh, it is useful for viewing superficial and abnormalities. Dif it is also useful for differentiating cysts from neoplasms and benign from malignant lesions. Uh, ultrasonography is also of use to guide biopsy and advise further imaging choices. Um, uh, the advantages of ultrasonography would be safety because it does not have any radiation involved. Again, uh, the salivary glands are easily accessible and any calcification within the gland can be noticed um, as well as uh, details of the uh, presence of the any uh, anomalies as well as a neoplasm can be noted down. So this is uh, an example of how the parotid uh, looks on um, ultrasonography um, and also color Doppler has been applied which gives you a clear idea of how the facial artery and its branches appear and um, how the submandibular gland appears um, as well as uh, how the parotid appears on the uh, ultrasonography. Multi-detector computer tomography is uh, used to display uh, both soft and hard tissue windows um, to view the salivary glands and surrounding structures. Uh, the image viewing after administration of contrast dye uh, gives a hyperdense appearance and is very useful in identifying and diagnosing inflammatory conditions, neoplasia and lymph node involvement. This is a case where you're seeing a plunging granula, which is a large space occupying mass seen in the floor of the mouth, it is a well circumscribed cystic lesion predominantly occupying the left submandibular space, causing a mass defect or effect on the uh, submandibular gland. So you can see that the gland has been pushed to one corner and you can see a large granula, which is a plunging granula. Uh, <clears throat> CT scan can also be uh, a scout image over which 
um, PET scans can be done. This is an example of a squamous cell carcinoma involving the left uh, sublingual space and an axial contrast enhanced CT image shows homogeneity uh, along with the left sublingual space and in B this is an image of um, PET CT scan. Magnetic resonance imaging of salivary glands uh, would be the image of choice for space occupying lesions such as cysts and neoplasia. Uh, the soft tissue contrast is superior and intravenous gadolinium contrast agents have to be injected into the um, uh, intravenously so that you can observe perineural and intracranial spread of disease more clearly. This is the normal appearance of a sublingual and submandibular uh, uh, space and the appearance of the um, sublingual gland on MRI as well as the submandibular gland bilaterally on the MRI. And this is just a diagrammatic representation of how the gland would look like on MRI. This is an example of an adenoid cystic carcinoma of the sublingual salivary gland. Uh, the, uh, this is the mass that you're able to see pointed with the white arrow mark. Um, the, this image in the sublingual space, it's demonstrating a lobulated um, <clears throat> mass, which is of a high T2 signal and a low T1 signal. It's actually enlarging and distorting the entire left sublingual gland. Also, there is a enhancement which is diffuse post contrast. This is an image after the contrast dye has been applied. Silography is a procedure that was first performed in 1902. It is an imaging technique exclusively used for the parotid and submandibular salivary glands. Silography involves infusion of the gland ductal system with an iodinated contrast agent and then uh, imaging the gland with the uh, projection imaging that is plane radiographs, fluoroscopy, CT or CBCT. Silography is the only imaging technique that can assess both morphology and function of the glands at the same time and that's something very important and unique about silography. The indications for silography would be chronic inflammatory conditions like obstructions of the ductal system, uh, and contraindications would be acute infections or in cases of immediately anticipated thyroid function test because the iodine, iodine in the contrast agent may interfere with test results. This is how the silography procedure is performed. For example, uh, locating the uh, uh, Stenson's duct opening and retrograde injection of the dye into the uh, ductal system. So um, the example of radiographs taken after the dye is injected, uh, this is how normal salivary, submandibular salivary ductal system uh, would look like, the normal ductal architecture. And this pattern is called as a leafless tree pattern in radiology terminology. Uh, the, if there are strictures in the ductal system, this can lead to the appearance which is called as sausage-like appearance. This happens because the dye hasn't flown consistently throughout the ductal system due to the presence of strictures. <clears throat> A silogram, a conventional silogram demonstrates multiple filling defects within the uh, Wharton's uh, uh, duct in this uh, particular image here. Um, it, this is consistent with the presence of siloliths uh, because the silolith obstructs the duct and the dye cannot completely flow into the gland uh, smoothly. Now, this is another patient where you can see pre and post contrast injection silogram images which dis, uh, this is pre-contrast pre, um, injection, this is post-contrast injection and you it easily demonstrate where the obstruction of the uh, duct is happening is because of a large uh, silolith or a large stone. Silography in Jogren syndrome is a very important radiographic uh, feature. Uh, silectasis leads to branchless fruit-laden tree appearance, also called as a cherry blossom appearance. This happens because after the dye is injected, it is retained in the inflamed um, salivary SNI with, because of silectasis and it is unable to... Um, flush out the saliva and hence the dye remains there giving the appearance of uh, the cherry blossom or branchless fruit laden tree appearance. 
Here I have included various images in plain radiograph. This is a pan crop panoramic image and this is a lateral uh, skull view. This is images on a CT scan and this is on the um, image on a silography. So post silography, this is a fluoroscopy image um, and CT image and plain images done um, for after silography. So like I mentioned to you, after si injecting the dye, various methods of imaging can be done to view the uh, effects of the dye in the ductal system. <clears throat> this is the appearance again on a silogram or a si after silography of a normal submandibular salivary gland. You can see the uh, leafless tree appearance, the duct and its entire ductal system and the uh, branches. When there is a foreign body, you will definitely see that there is obstruction. Uh, if digital subtraction silography is performed, uh, this would be the stages of the silography and you will be able to see the dye slowly filling out within the uh, ductal system and it completely fills out here. So this is the uh, injection of the uh, silography dye. Silo endoscopy was first used in 1990s. It is slightly different from silography. In, the, in silo endoscopy, as the name suggests, it is a direct visualization of the parotid and submandibular major ducts. It's minimally invasive. It's a technique uh, which is indicated for diagnosis and management of obstruction, specifically within the ductal system. And uh, silolith retrieval and stricture dilation tools are available because of which, which you can see in the picture here, which, where, which can help to retrieve uh, uh, especially an obstruction caused by stones within the ductal system. Again, siloendoscopy is contraindicated in acute inflammations. This is an example of exploration of the Wharton's duct. Uh, you can note the diameter of the duct and uh, it is sufficient for insertion of a surgical endoscope for interventional siloendoscopy. A lacrimal probe has been used in this duct for uh, correct location purpose and uh, it is important for you to note the uh, location of the endoscope for accurate insertion as well. Paranasal sinus anomalies and their imaging. The major methods of imaging of the paranasal sinus is a, a simple maxillary periapical view which can show you the floor of the maxillary antrum, a panoramic view which can show you a larger view of the maxillary sinus along with parts of the inferior, posterior and anterior medial walls. The floor of the maxillary sinus may not be viewed very clearly. Um, for which you might have to rely on better, more uh, uh, images with higher resolution and 3D imaging like CBCT and multi-detector CT scans, which help you evaluate the sinus diseases and extension of diseases, as well as uh, chronic or recurrent sinusitis. MRI can be used for soft tissues um, views or soft tissue extension of neoplasm into the sinus and differentiation of retained fluid secretions from soft tissue mass in the sinus. The range of normal uh, position of the maxillary sinus relative to the premolar and molar teeth is shown in these periapical images. Um, in <clears throat> observe images A to D, you will see that in image A, there is no apparent floor of the um, maxillary sinus and uh, you will see in B and uh, C that there is progressively more pneumatization of the alveolar um, process in B and C whereas in D you will see uh, draping of the maxillary sinus border over the apices of the teeth and is very very particularly evident in this case. This is the panoramic image which is showing you of a loculus of the left maxillary sinus draping of the roots uh, mimicking a benign space occupying lesion but in fact it's just the uh, maxillary sinus which is appearing um, like a large cystic area here. The waters view also called as paranasal sinus view gives a very clear appearance of all the sinuses especially the maxillary frontal sinuses. Um, and here you can see maxillary sinusitis by the uh, uh, air fluid level which is occupying the entire uh, maxillary sinus on the right side whereas the left side appears more clearer. clearer. 
this is example of again plane radiographs using a panoramic image to observe a mucus retention phenomenon uh, which is seen as a radio opaque soft tissue mass within the floor of the sinus and the image on the right shows you the uh, effect of odontogenic cysts in the maxillary on the maxillary sinus you can see that the floor of the maxillary sinus is pushed and the entire cystic uh, a cyst has occupied the entire maxillary sinus with also displacement of the impacted teeth within the cystic space. And you can see that the patient here is having a large swelling over the uh, cheekbone and specifically the maxillary uh, bone area with even involvement of the um, uh, nose. CT scan of the maxillary sinus. This is a coronal view of the maxillary sinuses of uh, picture uh, A which is showing you complete opacification of the left sinus and uh, circumferential mucosal thickening of the uh, right sinus. This is mucosal thickening of the uh, sinus space on the right side and left side is completely opacified. Picture B is a sagittal view of multi-detector CT scan which is showing you mucositis in, in the uh, ethmoidal uh, region or the ethmoidal air cells. <clears throat> um, again, uh, views of uh, uh, retention pseudocyst phenomenon. It can be very clearly viewed as a radiopaque soft tissue mass seen in a periapical radiograph or a maxillary sinus radiograph. And this is also seen in a CBCT cropped uh, panoramic uh, generated panoramic image as well as in the on a CBCT um, axial image and coronal image as well. CBCT scans again can be used to visualize sinus pathology. This is an image just trying to show you the association of maxillary sinus pathology and healthy teeth. Uh, if you look onto the right side, these are roots uh, where are which are within the maxillary sinus and there is a pathology in the sinus. And a, a picture below this shows you roots which are outside the maxillary sinus and there is a pathology in the sinus. So you were able to make out healthy teeth and their relationship to the uh, pathology. On the other hand, uh, you are seeing a normal sinus floor where the roots are looking like they are protruding into the sinus floor, very close to the sinus floor. And uh, an image of healthy teeth and a healthy normal sinus where the roots are away from the sinus. So it all depends on the size of the sinus and the pneumatization. That means how much amount of air content is there within the sinus and whether there's a pathology in the sinus, which determines how close the teeth are to the sinus space. Let's now look at trauma, which is a major part and imaging plays a major part in it for diagnostic evaluation of a patient with trauma to teeth and jaws. The applied radiology aspect for any patient who is um, a case of trauma is to first of all to develop prioritized treatment plan based on severity of the trauma. Next, to determine the presence of life threatening injuries to provide essential information about presence, location and orientation of fracture planes and fragments, also adjacent vital anatomical structures, foreign bodies that may be embedded in soft tissue and to monitor healing and detection of long-term changes due to trauma by taking post-therapeutic images. When we're talking about dento alveolar trauma, it can happen to all uh, persons of all age groups. The causes could be uh, ranging from contact sport, violence, falls, motor vehicle accidents, uh, to children uh, having trauma to the dento alveolar structures uh, due to playground activities or even child abuse. Now, these are some images of how dento alveolar trauma looks like, with, right from evulsion of teeth to uh, tooth fractures and alveolar fractures and also soft tissue trauma. <clears throat> the choice of imaging in cases of dento alveolar trauma um, should start off with the, it should depend on severity and the area of involvement. Intraoral images are the first choice and having the best resolution and specially used to detect coronal and root fractures, displacement of tooth from its socket. Root fractures to periomycal images at two different horizontal angulations would be very uh, useful. Uh, also, images of teeth of opposing arch should be done just to rule out fracture of the opposing arch. 
uh, soft tissues like lips and cheeks if there is any potential foreign bodies embedded be due to a fall um, you could have mud or sand or even a tooth that is uh, um, displaced and injured a fragment which is uh, embedded within this soft tissue Panoramic imaging is used to examine broad anatomical structure. Uh, it helps us to visualize dentoalveolar injuries, especially mandibular fractures. CBCT, especially a small uh, field of view, CBCT provides high resolution and multiplanar imaging, especially for fractures of teeth and alveolar process. Uh, chest or abdominal imaging may be required in cases of accidental aspiration or ingestion of a tooth or a foreign body or a fragment. <clears throat> Radiologic signs of fracture of tooth or bone would be number one, the presence of one or two usually sharply defined radiolucent lines within the anatomic boundaries of a fracture, a change in the normal anatomical outline or shape of the structure, a loss of continuity of outer border and appearance of step type of defect, an increase in the radio opacity of structure and doubly radio opaque uh, areas. So if you were to look at the classification of dentoalveolar injuries, dental fractures if, could be a crown fra infraction, crown fracture uncomplicated, crown fracture complicated, fracture of enamel dentine cementum uncomplicated, fracture of enamel dentine cementum complicated and root fracture. Periodontal tissue injuries could be concussion, subluxation and luxation. Injuries to supporting bone could be due to comminution of alveolar bone, single wall alveolar fracture, fracture of alveolar process and fracture of maxilla or the mandible. This is a diagrammatic representation of how crown fractures look like. This is infraction which just involves the uh, enamel only. These are uncomplicated fractures involving only enamel, enamel and dentine or a complicated fracture where pulp is involved. Um, crown root fractures can be uncomplicated or could be complicated with involvement of the pulp and larger portion of the tooth and root. Root fractures per se could be involving the cervical one third, middle one third or apical one third of the root. Moving on, luxation without displacement uh, could be a minor movement of the tooth within the socket leading to concussion or subluxation uh, where again there is minor movement of the jaw with, and the widening of PDL space happens. Luxation with displacement involves extrusive luxation where the tooth you can see wider part of the PDL um, widened uh, or the tooth is luxated in a lateral position or there is displacement or it is intruded or totally evulsed, which is called as evulsion. This is example of horizontal root fractures. Here you can see a middle third fracture, oblique fracture, which is also horizontal fracture. Again, a middle fra third fracture of the root. Vertical fractures, again, have poor prognosis. This could be due to a lot of stress uh, in this weight-bearing tooth uh, and root canal treated tooth, where you can see a vertical fracture. This is also a vertical fracture of the entire root and this is a crown root vertical fracture. Periodontal tissues injuries could be a concussion, subluxation, luxation and evulsion. Concussion leading to vascular injuries and internal resorption are seen in this image here. You can see a large internal resorption defect within the uh, pulp as well as a concussion defect. Also, it can lead to widening of PDL space. Luxation can lead to the entire dislocation of tooth from its socket and extrusion. Alveolar process per se when it sustains injury. These are some images to show you how the teeth are displaced and the entire fragment of the anterior part of the uh, jaw could be displaced. Um, <clears throat> this is just to show you a diagrammatic representation of the different types of alveolar process fractures. This is again a classification of alveolar process fractures. Um, you can go through this article for detailed management. Um, uh, more about dentoalveolar fractures and uh, mandibular fractures would be dealt in detail in under the oral surgery uh, trauma aspect. So this is an example of mandibular fracture and a panoramic view showing you the fracture involving the uh, angle and as well as parasymphysis region fractures. 
These are again examples of various uh, extent of mandibular fractures. You will see in the radiolucent line, um, which is involving the tooth in the body, or multiple uh, radiolucent lines are seen in this first image here. More examples, more and more complicated examples of mandibular fracture where an entire fragment has fractured and multiple bone um, uh, areas of bone are fractured. Also CT image showing you areas of fracture of the mandible. Condylar fractures um, and uh, body of man angle of uh, mandible fracture is seen in this conventional uh, uh, skull image which is a reverse down view. And there are various classification of fractures uh, based on the displacement of the condylar head and the neck. Um, again, like I told you, this is beyond the details of which are beyond the scope of this lecture. You will have to uh, look at oral surgery lectures which deal with fractures in detail. Maxillary fractures is an example of a blowout fracture of the orbital flow where you can see the floor is uh, multiple areas of fracture. And this is a jug handle view which is also called as a submento vertex view which is showing you a zygomatic arch fracture compared to the normal right side, the left side is fractured. Lastly, pathologic fractures uh, which is a terminology used for fractures that happen due to a large cystic lesion leading to, um, which is extending to, for example, here in this case, to the floor of the, um, to the lower border of the mandible and fracturing the jaw because of the extent of the cystic area involved. Soft tissue calcifications, uh, we're coming to the last part of the uh, topic now. Uh, dystrophic calcifications due to deposition of calcium source into site of chronic inflammation can lead to soft tissue calcification. These could be due to calcified lymph nodes, dystrophic calcification of tonsil, uh, cysty sarcoids like uh, causing caused by tapeworm infection, arterial calcifications and calcified atherosclerotic plaques. Idiopathic calcifications like siloliths, phleboliths, uh, of the vein rhinolids and antrolids and ossification of styloid ligament. Um, this is for example uh, images of carotid artery calcifications uh, which can be seen at the um, below the angle of mandible region uh, superimposing over the hyoid bone bilaterally where you can see that there is calcification of the due to arterial calcification of the carotid artery. Also, uh, these well-defined radio opacities which are seen are ectopic calcifications on either side due to tonsilloliths or calcifications present within dystrophic calcifications within the tonsils. So that brings me to the end of this chapter. Um, I would want you to do further reading from the textbook references provided here as well as the references within the uh, lecture notes itself on the slides. Um, and uh, if you do have any doubts, kindly feel free to write back to me. Thank you.